Please welcome Ibrahim Asim to the stage. Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, my name is Ibrahim Asim. I'm a self-taught technical founder. Uh, I ran a web development agency for about 10 years. And then I specialized in environmental compliance and GIS software for primarily government agencies and defense contractors. Um, so including Lockheed Martin, the, gov the US government, and the United Nations. Uh, the product and the company that uh, we're talking about today is eCorte. Um, I wrote the first line of code for eCorte in August 2019, August 31st, actually. Just remembered from the conference, from the slide deck. And uh, we launched our first automated integration about four months later with the state of Colorado. We did a statewide uh, launch of our product January 1st, 2020. Uh, in this talk, I'm just going to talk about eCorte, how we're gaining our users, and how we uh, compete and bid on public RFPs. Government buyers are a bit different. Uh, the government persona, they're, uh, they're not exactly known for speed. Uh, they have a very different dynamic in terms of the value that they see from working with vendors. Um, and the types of relationships that they develop with vendors. Um, I would say that the biggest thing really is the high risk and no reward for change. You know, like if you have an IT um, in any government purchasing decision, you're not going to have one buyer. You're going to have multiple buyers from each department. You know, of course, if it's a small, like in our case, we work with the court system. Sometimes we might have a local courthouse. They have a judge and they have a court clerk. Done. There's no IT department. You do one demo. You're done. You're, the, they like the product, they sign up, and they start moving forward. But in most cases, especially larger uh, populations, anything really over 50, 100,000 population, um, you're going to have multiple departments. You're going to have a long procurement cycle. You're going to have uh, local preferences. So they definitely will ask that they want five referrals from other courts in their same area, not just in their same state but in their same area, of their same size, of similar case types, of similar caseloads, very, very, it's not just risk averse, it's risk management. Um, and so they have these built in into their procurement and uh, uh, procurement procedures. So it's not something that's just dependent on each individual uh, county or, or, or government customer. And the other problem, so to speak, is, uh, or opportunity, um, startups are a bad word. You know, when we were first uh, doing demos with judges and court clerks and administrators and IT, that's one of the first things we'd say. We'd say, you know, we're a startup working with uh, court reminders, court notification system. Immediate shutdown. <laughs> Immediate shutdown. Really, they want vendors who have been established, who are mature, who have an pro existing product, not something new, not something that's going to get developed, not something that's going to get customized. Um, so it really is a bad word, and it might even, like, I've had judges where they'll re visually recoil within the, within the demo, like, oh, we don't, we don't want to work with your type of people. Um, but all of these also have, um, all of these cons, so to speak, there's also advantages. Um, so there's also pros that if you do understand it, and you do have to change from a typical B2B or, uh, or consumer-oriented startup, and, you know, patience is one of the biggest things related to that. <laughs> Our revenue is still moderate. Um, like I said, we started in the beginning of 2020. Right now, we're about a little bit more than this in terms of uh, recurring subscription revenue. And in our case, um, our primary product now is text messaging. So we have a combination of all of our customers have subscriptions other than um, limited customers who do like a pay-as-you-go. But even with the pay-as-you-go, they have some type of annual subscription, and then um, they pay the usage based on their messages. Um, so yes, text messages are our primary usage-based product. Um, and we were really API first, we were really automation first, um, thinking about just, you know, you have a court system or a county, and they have thousands of cases at any given time. You're not going to have a clerk log in and manually send off a message. At least that's what I... Uh, assumed. So we went API first from the beginning. That's what really got us our um, statewide customers. That's what got us our integrations with a lot of the biggest uh, case management companies in the in the in the space. Um, 
and then we started building out more of the the GUI or the UI, so to speak, for the web application for court clerks, administrators, officers um, to log in and kind of use it as like a WhatsApp or a messenger uh, for their clients and for um, you know for the people that they're working with. And although to this day our automated customers, of course, they continually grow and grow, and especially with post-COVID, um, our uh, our usage is is, is constantly growing. Um, the the ratio of growth with the one-off messages, the manual messages, is actually more. Um, so we see more uh, or a higher increase in terms of just court staff sitting on this all day and using it as their messenger. Um, and it allowed, because it's multi-channel, um, it really covers all of their bases. If they have a court cancellation, they can send a court cancellation. If they need some jurors to show up, they can send a message to the jurors. If they need to verify whether a defendant clicked on a particular uh, message because he failed to appear to, for a court date, they can do that. And so this is something that um, is like a, 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 a email or a calendar. It's a utility that they're using all day, in addition to the automated uh, integrations. So we really started primarily text messages, emails, phone calls. Uh, majority of his text messages, like I said, um, and the initial use case was uh, reminders for defendants, court date reminders. You have a court date coming up. This is pre-COVID. Uh, it's not going to be online. You know, they send you a reminder, multiple reminders with the information that you need to know. And I'm not sure if anybody has worked, interacted with the court system in the U.S. Uh, if you don't get a text message, you're going to get a letter. That letter may take a month, two months from the first time that you maybe got a traffic ticket from the, uh, um, from the police officer. And you may not have a consistent address. You may not have the same address. You may travel. It's just, it's, it's an outdated, archaic system. Um, and so in just with municipal courts in the United States, um, so that's like traffic tickets and other normal, like simple cases, average of 23% FTA rate, no show rate, in terms of the number of people that don't show up for a court date. And that impacts in terms of, of course, that impacts, it impacts the court itself. You know, you have lots of government officials, lots of government staff, that it's, it's, it's a huge cost every time somebody, someone doesn't show up. But in addition, now the sheriff's office or the law enforcement department has to le has, it will get a, a, a bench warrant issued for the arrest of that individual. Even if it was a simple mistake, even if it was they didn't get the letter, um, they were, you know, they had a, whatever case may be, um, they weren't even aware. Um, but now they have a criminal record they get arrested, and all over some $100 traffic ticket. <laughs> um, so secondly, our uh, payments, uh, uh, feature, or payments usage or use case, um, this is for you know, sending you, uh, you had the court date reminder, now you have a $100 uh, reminder, or you have a message to, to, that you have a $100 obligation to the court. Um, and so we built this in with a built-in payment portal, with built-in payment uh, pay plan calculations, monthly payments, that kind of thing. And we're just, we launched in the beginning of this year, and we're just seeing, um, you know, this month is roughly 956,000 last month in terms of payment reminders sent and collected on by the courts. Um, as it is, although we do have a payment uh, portal, um, we don't have the merchant accounts, the processing accounts. So what the courts all end up doing is, is they use their own merchant uh, provider, and so we're not monetizing on that end transaction. But this is something that we do expect to the self-pay, something that we expect to launch uh, in the coming year, in January of next year. And in that case, the defendant or whoever is pay making the payment is technically paying us, and then we pay the court um, the amount that they're, that they're due. Have you ever paid a traffic ticket online? Most of those websites are pretty horrible, right? And there's usually at least 5 or 10% processing fee, like above and beyond. Yeah, exactly. So our plan is just make it beautiful, make it easy, make it fast, make it simple. And in addition, because there's also a, a, a trend or a way or a trend within the justice system to try to make uh, the justice system within the U.S. more accessible, more fair, um, you know, eliminate... Uh, undue burdens, undue hassles. And that's one of the things that, these, that the existing payment companies like Encourt really take advantage of people because they're charging 10% processing fee. You know, you don't need to do that. <laughs> uh, 
Um, and actually, one of the interesting things about this is that uh, some jurisdictions, like in Washington, are actually making it against the rules of the court to charge any money beyond. So if the court, if the judge orders you to pay $100, the court's not legally allowed to accept anything more than that. And so we ha actually have a list of existing uh, customers in the state of Washington that, that, that are ready to use our full payment processing feature um, as long as we don't charge beyond the 3% that, you know, the typical 3% plus or minus 2.9% plus 35 cents, whatever processing, you know, like typical credit card processing fees. Um, and then we give the court exactly what they, uh, what they requested, the $100, and they don't get anything beyond that. Um, we're also doing fairly well in, in, in SEO, um, primarily desktop. All of our users are desktop. Of course, this is a niche within a niche, so there's not a lot of, uh, there's not a lot of volume, but uh, notif uh, keywords like court reminders, since the start, we've been essentially number one or number two for organic position for that. And we're working on launching a, a, a brand new website, and we're starting to rank on a bunch of other similar keywords like juror reminders, victim reminder software, probation reminders, geolocation reminders, all these different types of notifications and the use cases. Um, so yeah, that's in terms of court reminders. Of course, in terms of SEO, I've heard a lot of people talk about SEO today. Uh, content is king, that's a big one. Good performance, accessibility, mobile friendliness, I and mean, there's a lot to it. Um, uh, in terms of our SEO with our market, what we found really is that Uh, we basically become the standard or the requirements that they use or that the court uses if they're going to issue an RFP. An RFP is a request for proposal. That's when the court says, okay, or when any government customers, really any customer technically, um, but usually RFPs are only used within enterprise and government, and they'll put out their specifications and their requirements and uh, you know, allow any vendor, any approved vendor to bid on that. And so in our case, what we found is every time we update the website, and there's new RFPs, the verbiage that are on the RFPs is exactly pulled from our website. Um, and so that's, that's actually been quite nice um, because every time there is a new RFP, I'm not saying there's a huge volume of these RFPs, uh, you know, there's only so many government agencies, uh, we get a phone call. So actually, one of our customers is Tarrant County, that's Fort Worth, um, here in Texas. We started with them in 2020, I'll show, uh, yeah, I'll, I'll show an example of, uh, of, of them, but we started with them in 2020, and that was one court. Then the next year it became two other courts, um, and now we're working with eight other courts, so that's 11, uh, 11 courts in total. And then the state of Texas uh, finalized a new bill making court reminders a legally required obligation on the courts. Uh, within a couple weeks, we got a phone call from the Department of, Texas Department of Information Resources here in Austin, wanting us to, you know, talk to them about doing a statewide implementation. Um, it should be an app for everything. Absolutely, of course, it should be an app for everything. <laughs> uh, one of the, if you are going to work with government, which I don't recommend, <laughs> uh, the terms of service, the jurisdiction, like anything that really is related to their risk, uh, there's, a, there's a legal term for the, for the indem uh, indemnification, thank you, sir. Anything related to that, they're not taking it. They're not taking the risk. Um, and so all of our contracts, of course, we had multiple attorneys uh, work with us on them, but all of our contracts are friendly to the government customer. I didn't write the enterprise early. <laughs> I, <laughs> I, no, I saw, I saw that before. I, I liked it, but I, I just never used the word enterprise. It's not really, doesn't really make sense. Uh, but in the sense of you know, larger contracts, uh, you know, a longer sales cycle, uh, relationship-based sales cycle, not really with the government, at least not initially with the RFPs. Um, but you are able to sell uh, you know, 25K plans when just starting. Um, we do use the implementation fees um, to kind of, one-off implementation fees to kind of cover 
our initial expenses. So basically any RFP project is automatically gonna be a longer project. So they may have already taken a year to prior to us winning the RFP, and then it may take another year from there to actually go through and do the implementation. And so really the one-off cost is just to cover that, that waiting time. Um, and otherwise, if we, you know, we have much lower pricing in the starter pricing, and in that case, the customer starts paying right away, it's all yearly contracts, and so they don't really have a one-off uh, implementation. And sometimes I made a mistake and, and made that one-off implementation optional, where it would say, if your IT department does the work, basically, <laughs> and not us. And then what ends up inevitably happening is that we end up doing the same higher quality of, uh, of service, like one of the previous talker, uh, speakers, Muhammad Yunus, was saying, in terms of um, immediate response, being proactive, a done-for-you service, and you know, just always being there to help them. Because if, if you have a problem and you're sending out, just like his with his event com virtual event company, if there's a problem with a virtual event, that's a disaster. If there's a problem with our system, we could send out you know, uh, the wrong information to the wrong people, the wrong court cases, the wrong victims. The wrong, you know, we're dealing with all kinds of uh, victims, jurors, witnesses, officers, judges, clerks. Like all these people get attorneys. They all get different types of messaging, and so and we're working with case management systems that were programmed in in a previous, literally in a previous century. <laughs> you know, and I was thinking in the '80s, '80s and '90s, um, and so that's what these costs. That's what these uh, you know one-off costs are for is to kind of work with them a little bit more to offer that to have that budget. So these are example. Um, Example contracts. Um, one on the right over there is with is with a county in Arkansas. One on the left over here is with the uh, Colorado statewide. So you can see like there's a subscription component, and then there's a uh, a usage component based on what you use. This is from um, 2020. So this is one of the first contracts that we went live with, and this was the mistake that I did that I didn't make it. This includes a certain number of messages. Right? And so it's a little bit higher price just in terms of the base cost. Um, it gives them a certain number of messages, so I can always guarantee, which they've actually already exceeded this, but I can always guarantee that there's going to be a certain number of message subscription or revenue from the, message, uh, from the messages themselves. Whereas this one is just 10K a year plus whatever messages you use. And they initially estimated that they were going to spend more than 100K a year on the messages, but that was pre-COVID. So then once COVID hit, courts all get shut down. Now I only have a 10K contract with pay as you go on two cents a message. So much, much less uh, uh, expected volume. So a statewide contract ended up actually spending less than a county contract, um, just to give you an idea. Now, now thankfully, um, that contract, all of them have substantially increased. That one's now doing, um, is actually doing close to its full initial estimate and it's expected to probably double um, next year. And that's because they also, they had a, a Colorado state bill that was passed requiring the court not notifications. When it was first passed, it was optional. So if the police officer stops you and says, hey, you have a $100 traffic ticket, would you like to get a reminder uh, or would you like to get notifications about this ticket via text message? Most people say no. <laughs> I, I would say no, I'm not giving an officer my phone number. Um, <laughs> So that was, I don't want to, I'll be disrespectful. Um, that was not the smartest idea. Um, but now they've amended the bill. And that's one of the things when you're working with government, you're out, you have these bill tracking software that you use. Um, and they just approved it. The governor just approved the amended version a couple months ago and has made, it, made the notifications required. And Opted, uh, default to opt you in. So you have a court case with Colorado, you're gonna get a notification no matter what. You can opt out after that, but if you have another court case coming up, they're gonna opt you back in. Um, and so that's, that ensures a nice volume for us. Um, so yes, pricing plans, uh, you know, if you're gonna work with uh, state of Texas, you're not gonna do a $1,000 a year subscription. Um, but if you're gonna work with you know, a small county in, in, or a rural county or a small population, really, we define it as anything less than 50,000 population. Um, anything like, anything uh, that size, we just give them the subscription plan. We say start with that 
And if you need more messages, um, you know, it's adjustable, but most of them will start with 10, 20, 25,000 messages. And then if they need more messages, uh, they can, you know, six months later, they can say, you know what, let's just increase more, uh, or they do the pay as you go. One thing I'm super excited about is finally formalizing a referral process. This is something that we don't have, unfortunately. We should have uh, done you know, from, from day one. Um, I didn't understand the, the importance of referrals within, within government buyers. Uh, but that really is what's been our main driver um, between the, the just organic referrals that lead to our website um, or that generate an, an RFP. And so in this case, uh, we had a successful launch with a customer. A couple weeks later, they put us on, on their, they put us as the featured uh, story on their own conference, in their own internal conference. And then we just started getting, you know, referrals from other counties, other neighboring counties, um, right away. And that's one of the things that will, or one of the taxes that we'll do, and we've actually already started doing and, and has found success, but we want to make it automated. Um, our referral credits. So you, we can't give a government employee, you know, $50 or $100 to go do a referral on G2. It just doesn't work. They're not legally allowed to. Technically, they can accept less than $50 uh, gifts, but even then, it's not, lo it's not, it's not looked uh, uh, kindly on. Um, so in our case, we give them free credits. So free message credits. They are cost conscious. So if they say, hey, we just saved you, you know, we just got you $500 worth of... Uh, messages, which for us costs us, you know, next to nothing. Um, to them, that's value. And that's not going into a personal, you know, the judge's bank account or the clerk's uh, Amazon account. It's going into their own uh, customer account. And, you know, that, that we think, um, hopefully, you know, maybe a year from now, we'll see the, the true results from that type of program. Um, and in terms of future growth channels, um, we currently have some integrations, live integrations with case management companies. The biggest company within this space is, uh, is really an elephant named Tyler Tech, uh, multi-billion dollar, uh, primarily government software company based in Texas. And they don't really like us. Uh, <laughs> so they actually built out a product um, to kind of compete with us, their notification product. Initially, they were recommending customers to use us. Um, they said, hey, we don't have an API, but there's this new company named eCorte that has integrated, that has done an integration with Odyssey, their case management system. We recommend you go use them. And then over time, that's become a more uh, anti antagonizing relationship. Um, but there are smaller uh, case management companies that are more localized. So those are the ones, like, we have some relationships in uh, Illinois, in uh, Ohio, for example. One, co one case management company has got us more than, like, a dozen courts or so. And those are really nice because it cuts down on the, uh, it eliminates, basically, the onboarding. Um, you know, they come in, they already have their data automated. It's just a matter of, you know, doing their configuration and, and setup, and, and they go from there. And then in terms of uh, partnerships with case management, it's a win case management companies, it's, it's a win-win. Um, you know, they have a new product or a new feature, a new module, so to speak, new pro uh, that they could bill for, um, that they could earn money on. And, uh, you know, most of them, they're not fixing their, they're not adding new features. They're from the 90s. They're, they're, you know, they're keeping the product as is. Um, I, I can't tell you the number of conversations that I've sat on just waiting for a meeting, you know, waiting for my next meeting with the IT employees. And they're just arguing with their uh, with their vendor about, hey, we want a new feature for this drop. The vendor says, eh, we're not, you know, eight thousand dollars. And they're like, it's just an option. We just want another option in the drop down. And they're like, sorry, it's it's uh, it's um, out of life, or some other term like that. Like it's manufacturing life of software apparently is expired. <laughs> Um, so really, we do see the we do see the partnerships with case management companies as being uh, a, a nice um, growth channel. We are in negotiations. Can't talk about it too much, but we're in negotiations with a, uh, a case management company that has a contract with uh, federal courts um, for all the federal courts, basically, including immigration. Um, and we're also integrated with their system in an unofficial integration, and so. 
that's something where we think they're going to come to us eventually when they realize they can't do it themselves. Um, or they're afraid because our same customers that ask us for the court reminders, they ask us for case management capabilities. Um, so really, it's just a matter of you know, what features and what use cases that we want to support. Um, and you know, we see the uh, future with that as limitless, especially post-COVID. Uh, you know, the court system and the justice system really scrambled in the last two years to quickly adjust. Most of them in reality did not. Most of them in reality just shut down the court, shut down most cases. And if it was a simple case or, or like, like I said, like the traffic cases, um, those they kept running, uh, you know, virtually over Zoom. Since the beginning of this year, uh, you know, many states... California, Nevada, Arizona are starting to formalize legal procedures or legal rules around uh, court virtualization, justice system virtualization in general. Um, you know, because they were operating under emergency rules before. And so once things became normal, so to speak, came back to normal, uh, you know, judge couldn't just say, hey, we're gonna go back to Zoom. They had to have the state have established rules and procedures. And now that's actually being formalized and, and added into um, existing law of basically virtualizing the court system. Um, so we do see a lot of uh, growth in the future. Thank you.